good, good. So I guess there's a lot of guys that are down at uh, Summit to Summit, and hopefully they will come back filled up and fired up and, and uh, ready to go crazy for Jesus. Amen. All right, so there was a little boy playing out in the yard, and he fell, hurt his knee, scraped his knee, ran into the house crying, and uh, his dad, you know, picked it up, kind of cleaned it up a little bit, and, and uh, they prayed, Lord Jesus, thank you for healing little Johnny, and uh, we believe that he is healed, and we are awaiting the manifestation. Sends Johnny back outside. Well, Johnny comes back a few minutes later. I said, Daddy, my knee still hurts real bad. He goes, well, you know, son, we prayed in faith. We're awaiting the manifestation. So he sends Johnny back outside. Well, Johnny comes in a third time. and He says, Daddy, my knee still hurts. When is the man from the station going to get here? <laughs> okay. All right, Proverbs 18, chapter 18, verses 20 through 21. Uh, we're doing blessing and cursing part two. And uh, if you missed part one, how many of you survived part one? Oh, man, people came back. Praise God. All right. If you missed that and want to watch that, it's, uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, but we're going to read this scripture. Uh, Proverbs 18, 20 through 21, it says this. A man's stomach will be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips will he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, as I've studied for this message, uh, these messages, you know, there's, there's a couple hundred verses at least um, that have to do with, with the tongue and, and words and, and the laws and properties of, uh, you know, the spiritual properties of words that we speak. Uh, and I just encourage you, whenever you're reading your Bible and you find scriptures that have to do with words and the tongue, pay very careful attention to those. Uh, I want you to repeat this with me. This is a spiritual law that we've been looking at. All right, all together. What you curse will be cursed. And what you bless will be blessed. Let's say that again together. What you curse will be cursed. And what you bless will be blessed. Now, this is a spiritual law. And it is working. In spite of what you believe or don't believe, it is working to your benefit or to your detriment. And we compared it with the law of electricity, right? Electricity can, can be a tremendous, it's intended to be a tremendous blessing to us, right? It heats our home, it cooks our food, uh, it, it, it heats our hot water so we can have a hot shower in the morning. And yet, if I disrespect the laws of electricity and I, I touch a, a live source of power, what, ha what can happen? I can, be, I can be killed instantly. So, what is intended to serve me can hurt me, depending on my level of recognition and respect for those laws. Amen? So, words have power. And, and I know, I, I've encountered some folks that just, you know, is, come on, is this really that big of a deal? Why do I need a message like this? I mean, everybody talks and the things that we say can't really be that big of a deal. Well, consider the words of Jesus. He tells us in Matthew 12, 36, that we're going to give an account for every idle word. So if Jesus says it's a big deal, I think it's a big deal. I think it's worthy of our attention, amen? And, uh, you know, we think about uh, James. In the book of James, uh, chapter 3, verse 2, he says this. We all err in many ways, but if any man does not err in word, he is a perfect man and able to control the whole body. So we're all in this together. According to James, we all err. With our tongue, we, we say things we shouldn't say. You know, a little bit further on, uh, James's language gets a little more strong. James chapter 3, verse 6, he says this, The tongue is a fire in a world of evil. The tongue is among the parts of the body, defiling the whole body, and setting the course of nature on fire, and it is set on fire by hell. 
Come on, James, don't sugarcoat it. Tell us what you really think about the tongue. So this is, this is serious. Our words are serious. And so it's something that we need to be intentional. We need to be informed and we need to be intentional about the kinds of things that we're saying and not saying. Uh, last week, I, I wanted to provoke you. I wanted to encourage a conversation with God about the kinds of things that you're saying. Have you, did, you, did you have opportunity this week to talk to God about the kinds of things that you're saying? What am I, what am I speaking over my, my mental and my emotional health? What am I speaking over my family and over my relationships and over my family and those kinds of things? And so I want to challenge you with another question this week. If, if, if God answers you back, what are you going to do with that? How are you going to respond? What if God begins to deal with you? about some things that you're saying. All right, so we wanna, we wanna respond to that. We wanna respond to that. So I want us to, to be proactive and uh, uh, do you have that confession? We're gonna, we're gonna do a, another confession together, all right? All right. Ready, set, go. With the Holy Spirit as my helper, I will choose my words with care, speaking them in faith while using God's wisdom, being obedient to his direction and correction so that I can enjoy everything Jesus died to give me. Amen. All right, now, for activation, I want you to reach over to the person next to you and grab a hold of their tongue. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Never mind. It seemed like a good idea, but I, I don't think it'll work. All right. So in terms of our confession and the words of our mouth, maybe this is, maybe you've heard preaching about this before. Maybe, maybe this is all new information, but I want, to, I want to reassure you that God loves you and that he is committed to your growth. God, God wants you to grow up in this. God wants this to function to your benefit. And so we have to cooperate with that process because he's going to, we need to, we need to understand that there's, there's going to be correction, there's going to be repentance. There's going to be steps of obedience that we have to take if we want to grow in this. And we need to ask for his help when we need it. I've, I've encountered some things where I've just, Lord, I'm really having a hard time. I want to obey you, but I'm having a hard time. Help me. Help me obey you. And then we trust the process. And remember Philippians 1.6, it says that he who began a good work in you Maybe this is a struggling thing to, to really change the way, to build new habits and to change the way you, you talk. But he who began a good, good work in you is faithful to complete it. Amen. He's, he's faithful. So if we desire to harness this spiritual law to work in our favor, there's five disciplines that we're going to need to develop. We looked at two last week. We're going to look at two more today. Uh, we're we're going to just quickly review last week and just kind of hit some high spots uh, for that. And so the first one we talked about is the, the discipline of, of filling our heart intentionally uh, with the Word of God. Luke 6.45 tells Jesus is speaking. He says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And uh, this, this is something that really, you know... Filling the heart with the word of God sets us up for success for all the other things that we want to do. So Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then in Matthew 15, 11, it says, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it's what comes out of the mouth. So there's this cycle. I've got things in my heart that are not good. I speak those things, curses and profanity and negativity and all these kinds of things. And then it just, it defiles me, right? It's this cycle of sinful words. And we need that cycle broken. We need that cycle broken. Only Jesus, only the power of God can break that cycle. Amen? 
And so to fill the heart intentionally, we have to prepare it properly. Now, we looked at Mark chapter 4. We looked at the parable of the sower. And it describes to us some, some characteristics and some properties of the human heart. Now, understand that when we talk about the heart, we're not talking about the blood pump, right? We're talking about the spirit. We're talk, talking about the part of us that is like God that is born again. When we receive Jesus, our spirit is born again. And so we begin this process of, of removing things that don't need to be there, and God deposits truth in our hearts. So we talked about the fact that the word is the seed, the soil is the heart, and thank God the condition of the heart can be changed. Why? Because we want the seed of God's word to do what seed does. What does seed do? Seed, seed reproduces after its kind. And we want a harvest of the word of God in our life. Amen? Now, of course, the first step for us is to be born again. And we need to have the heart, we must be reborn, we need to have the heart transformed. Really didn't get into this last week, but we also need to guard our hearts. There's a process that we're engaged in as we grow spiritually. Our heart is being transformed, it's being filled with the word of God. And then Proverbs 4.23 tells us this. This is the amplified version. It says, keep and guard your heart with all vigilance and above all that you guard, guard your heart for out of it flow the springs of life or the forces or the issues of life. They flow out of the heart, right? We want to preserve that. So we need to understand that we have an enemy. Everybody knew that, right? We have an enemy that hates us. And so this, this process of, of spiritual growth and fruitfulness and the word of God producing in our lives, he wants to frustrate and interrupt that process. Because here's, here's what happens. When the word of God bears fruit in my life, if, if, I'm, a, if I'm a blessed, prosperous Christian bearing fruit, that type of Christian tends to be the type of Christian that makes other people want to become Christians. That's bad for the devil's business. So we want to guard the heart. Amen? So Hebrews 3, chapters 12 through 13. Remember that the author of Hebrews, remember his audience. He's talking to Christians. He's not talking to, to unbelievers. He's talking to Christians. And he says this. Be attentive, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, and you depart from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Again, that is written to Christians. The devil is playing for keeps. We want to transform the heart. We want to protect the heart. We want our lives to bear the kind of fruit that brings God glory. And we want to be Christians that make other people want to be Christians. Amen? All right. Uh, the next one we talked about after uh, filling our heart intentionally is we want to guard our tongue carefully. Now, we talked about the sins of the tongue. You know what? Last week I got caught twice. I got caught saying things I shouldn't say. You know how hard that is? Listen, you know, you preach a sermon... And then someone corrects you with your own sermon. You have any idea how hard that is? Yikes. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, it is what it is, I suppose. Okay, so Psalm 141, verse 3. The psalmist is praying. He says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Now, we went into um, some detail about some sins of the tongue. And I'm not going to go, go over that list again, but... We know that Christians are supposed to be separated from the world, right? I believe this presents one of the biggest opportunities that we have to separate ourselves from the world and be different. And I ask the question, what if all of those sins of the tongue were removed from the church? 
all the criticism and gossip and backbiting and lying and you know, just, just all these things. What if all those things disappeared? I think that our effectiveness, our witness, would be much, much more powerful. The way that we speak in front of others, especially, you know, not only Christians, but unbelievers. And, um, you know, sometimes people will, you know, oh, pastor, I just have such a hard time. You know, I, uh, my home or my school or my job or, you know, these different places, I just feel like I'm the only Christian. I'm the only Christian witness that's there. Well, you have an amazing opportunity. You have an amazing opportunity. I mean, eventually, of course you want to preach, you want to share, you want to evangelize, and you want to tell those people about Jesus. But listen, if you're fussing and cussing and criticizing and gossiping and telling and laughing at all the dirty jokes, and you're playing along and you're caught up in all of that, and then you're going to turn around and try to tell them about Jesus, it's not going to work. You have no credibility. We have got to separate ourselves. Um, so that, that just, uh, that, that presents such an opportunity for us and where we need to separate ourselves. Okay, now, we're going to move on. Uh, this is uh, the next one that we're going to talk about. Number three, we're, we're, we've guarded the heart. We've, we've cultivated the word of God in our hearts. We've, we've identified some sins of the tongue, but now we're going to be proactive and we're going to speak our words creatively. We're going to speak our words creatively. Amen. Proverbs 15, 4 says this. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it crushes the spirit. Now we have the opportunity to choose our words and to speak creatively. Amen. So Ephesians 5, 1 tells us this. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Now... You've probably heard the expression, if you read the word therefore, then you need to find out what it's there for. So I want to go back a little bit. This is not up here. This is just uh, something I want to read to you. This is the, the, the verses that precede um, Ephesians 5.1. It says, uh, Paul's writing, he says, Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building up, that it may give grace to the listeners, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, outbursts, blasphemies with all malice be taken away from you. Amen. We've talked a little bit about that, haven't we? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you, which leads right into chapter 5, verse 1. You know that when this was written, there were no chapters and verses, right? So then, after all of that, it's verse 1 says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Where do kids learn how to act initially? From watching their parents. And so part of our, our growth, part of our pursuit of understanding is, is we, want, we want to know the character of God. God acts a certain way. God thinks a certain way. God speaks a certain way. And the scripture is telling us to be imitators of God. God is a creator. God is a creator. And he has passed this on. He's, this, this creative ability has been passed on to us. Amen. We're made in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 says that we're made in the image of God. Now, Adam lost that image, but thank God Jesus came and regained what Adam lost. And so now what do we have? We have the Holy Spirit inside us. We have the spirit of creativity inside us. Now, God is a God, according to Romans 4, 17, he is a God that speaks of things that are not as though they are. Think about that. He, he speaks of things that are not as though they are. So God has an image or a desire in his heart. And I want to use the example of, of, of Abraham and Sarah. These are elderly people. He's promised them that they're going to have a child. All kinds of problems and limitations in that situation. 
Now, he spoke creatively over Abraham and Sarah and said, you're going to have a child. You're going to give birth to a child. Now, they, you know, laughed about that, right? They're looking at some limitations. Now, I, I believe that, you know, they were ultimately, they came into faith and they cooperated with the process and, and it happened. But the situation was that there, there were natural limitations and yet God had this image inside of him. He had a desire. He had a desired result in mind. And he wasn't moved by circumstances. He wasn't moved by the problems. He's never moved by what he sees. He has a desire in his heart that looks past all of that. And he speaks creatively. Now, we may not have the faith and the capacity to create a world, but I do believe that he's given us the faith and the capacity to have an impact on the world that we're in. We are surrounded by people and situations and problems and things that aren't right, that are opportunities for us to imitate God and to speak creatively into those situations. Amen. Hallelujah. Now think about the fact that our nature before was to curse things. Our nature before was to curse things. But we have a new nature. If we're born again and the Spirit of God is in us, we have a new nature. So I'm wondering, what, what kind of, in your circle of influence, what kinds of situations are waiting for someone to walk into that and look past circumstances and look back past problems and how things look and the way things are in the natural and see that there's an opportunity for you to speak creatively into that situation and breathe life. Who needs your words to be a tree of life? What kinds of situations are out there that need you to step into that situation and, and discern, here is an opportunity for me to release God's creative power and to change what seems unchangeable, what looks unchangeable, what looks impossible. I believe all of us are surrounded by people and problems and situations. You know, a few years ago, well, what began this whole, the idea, the seed for this message was reading through these Old Testament stories of Old Testament saints that they pronounced blessings, they re released prophetic words. They weren't praying. They were declaring. They were decreeing. They were releasing spiritual power into situations and people prophetically. I do not believe, I said this last week, I do not believe that as New Testament believers indwelt by the Holy Spirit, in any way should we lag behind the, the possibilities that we see, the things that were done by the Old Testament saints. I really believe that we have a better covenant based on better promises. We, we, can, we can go past, you know, we can grow, we can, we can stand on their shoulders and we can go beyond what we see modeled in the lives of Old Testament saints. Amen? They released their faith and they declared things and things happened. And I believe that this is a model and a pattern for us. All right, so you know, years ago, my wife created a list of promises. She went through and, and she has a whole list of promises that the Bible has for kids. There's all kinds of promises and blessings and, and prophetic declarations that are in the Bible pertaining to children. We have been declaring and proclaiming those things over our own children, over our nieces and nephews, over the children of this house. And we have seen some things come to pass. It's not 100% fulfilled. You know how long we're going to do that? As long as it takes. We are still declaring those things over kids. 
So if you're aware, well, just, okay, so we're talking about young people right now. Are there young people in your circle of influence or in your awareness, in your family, who are not living up to their God-given potential? They're not walking in the call of God on their life. Anybody know any young people like that? Yeah? Okay. I'm encouraging you, and you know what? We have, maybe my wife will have to run and make 30 or 40 or 100 copies, I don't know. What's stopping you from beginning to release the Word of God creatively into the lives of those young people? For, for people that have infants and small children, is it too soon for you to begin to declare and release the promises of God over that child? No, it isn't too soon at all. Now, as we release things creatively, of course, if we know the will of God for a certain situation, guess what? That fuels our faith. There's an old uh, Bible scholar named F.F. F. Bosworth who said this, faith begins where the will of God is known. So we read these scriptures that are full of promises, a godly destiny, a godly heritage, fruitfulness, blessing, purpose, all the things that you want to see happen in the lives of your children. You have the opportunity to speak and release the power of God creatively. Amen? I think that there are people and situations, all kinds of problems that are opportunities in disguise. I think this is something that we can be very, very intentional about and begin to release the power of God creatively. Is your tongue saved? Because if your tongue is saved, you can do this. Amen. And uh, if you want a copy of those scriptures to release, to pray over kids and young people, um, ask my wife. And uh, I know I just made work for her. That's how it goes sometimes. Amen. All right. Just consider the Lord's Prayer. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So, have you encountered any situations on earth that are below heaven's standards? Anyone? We have opportunity, don't we? And I love Bill Johnson talks about the fact that we are we're, we're, what does he say, a brokers. We're brokers of another kingdom. We're ambassadors for Jesus. And so we have the spiritual authority to step into situations that are not up to heaven's standard and release the power of God and bring it on earth as it is in, on, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Amen. We can release. We need to be intentional and release the word of God and speak creatively. Okay, so the last one, the next one, number four. This is, this is related to speaking creatively. I think that there's overlap, but I think that there are some distinctions um, that, we can, that we can see. But it, it works very similarly. Okay, number four. We want to bless others generously. We're speaking creatively and we're going to bless others generously. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it says this. Therefore, encourage, admonish, and exhort one another and edify. This is the amplified version. Edify, strengthen and build up one another just as you are doing. So, this is one of many, many scriptures in the Word of God that directs us to be intentional about the need to speak blessing and encouragement to other people. And certainly, amongst the body, we need to do this on a regular basis. We need to build each other up. We need to encourage one another. But let's not forget that outside of these four walls, there is a world that is blessing and encouragement starved. There's a lot of negativity 
and criticism, and, and I don't believe that it's, it's going to get better. That's why what, you know, our role to take it outside the four walls becomes more and more important uh, as the world kind of goes to hell in a handbasket. Amen? Has anyone else ever worked retail and dealt with the public? Oh, boy. I've done a number of things. I, I checked groceries for a number of years, and um, you just never know what kinds of people are going to come that you're going to have to deal with. And, and, and I just, I think that we are, uh, if we're out dealing with the public and we're talking to people, we have multiple opportunities every day uh, to thank people, to compliment people, to encourage people, to make people laugh, to, to just, I guess, to be part of the solution instead of the part of the problem. Amen. Now, you know, we, I mean, we're not going to be phony about this. I think people can spot the difference between something that, you know, just a, 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 a religious cliche, you know, and a genuine encouragement, a genuine word of compliment. But um, last year I was in the bank um, and I walked in the front door of my bank and there were, I don't know, three or four people in line waiting. And, and I mean, I just, I just walked in and the door closed and they said, oh, please, you know, just, uh, we're having troubles and so just, we just appreciate your patience and, 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 and thank you and we just feel terrible and, and we're having issues and we'll be with you as soon as we can. I mean, they just, the young lady was falling over herself, you know, and I, I got up, I said, it's, it's, it's fine. And I, I don't know, it was a few minutes, four or five minutes, and I get up and I, I just, I told her, I said, boy, I just, I can't help but wonder, you know, do you, do you deal with a lot of grumpy, impatient people? And she just, she said, you have no idea. You have no idea. You know, we want to tell people about Jesus, but sometimes we're going to have to earn the right first. To go into that situation and, and just demonstrate some patience and, and, and compliment people. Just, you know, leave, leave people better than you've found them. Look for opportunities for a genuine blessing. Ask God to set you up with divine appointments. I think we have appointments every day and we're just busy. We're on our way to do something. And we miss these opportunities to be a blessing to people. I, I just, I love the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. You know, he's on his way to do something, to go somewhere and do something. But he's, he's a, an, an example and a pattern for us because his radar's up. And when he encounters the woman at the well, everything stops to minister to this one woman. That's a huge example for us. You know what people will never, ever, ever forget? Is how you made them feel. People never forget how you made them feel. And so I'm not, I'm not talking about a good habit. I'm talking about a lifestyle of going and blessing people and being generous. Another time, uh, I was in a, a local grocery store and, uh, you know, there was a, a, a clerk that was obviously new. Obviously a new, per and probably her first day on the job. And, and she had a, a supervisor who was there um, trying to coach her, trying to help her, uh, but not being very helpful at all. I mean, they're just, just the way her, her, her tone, it was a tone of impatience, come on, I've showed you this four or five times. I mean, I've showed you this, why aren't you getting it? What's the matter with you? And so you just could tell that this young lady was rattled, right? And I just, I... I, I you know, demonstrated patience, patience. I, I got through, I've got my groceries, and I stopped, and I just said, you know, listen, you're doing a good job. You're going to be fine. It's going to be okay. You're doing just fine. 
Now you could tell by the look on this young woman's face, just the, the look of relief and the encouragement that she got from that, right? What did that cost me? Half a moment, five seconds. And the world around us, people are, people are starved. They're starved for encouragement and positivity. Again, it's not good. we don't want it to be a fake thing, but I really believe that God wants to set us up. Here's another verse I want to read to you. Proverbs 25, 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. That's kind of a different verse, isn't it? A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Well, this is how I believe the Lord wants to set you up. He wants to put you in the right place at the right time with the right person in the right situation so that you can speak words of life to that person. So a word fitly spoken. So think of this. So apples of gold in, in settings of silver. Now I'm not much of a decorator. I don't, I don't get to make any decorating decisions in my house at all. All right. But I want you to think about this. So apples of gold in settings of silver. Think about some kind of, I don't know, whether it would be, whether it would be artwork or, or, or a sculpture or some kind of intricate piece of craftsmanship. Something beautiful, something that would be on a pedestal in a home or a museum. Something that you look at, a piece of artwork that you look at and think, man, that is, that is beautiful. Expensive and beautiful. Don't let your kids play with it. Words can be that way. According to this scripture, words can have craftsmanship. Words can be crafted carefully so that when they are spoken under the inspiration and under the anointing of God, they, they hit home. They're that word that that person needed right at that moment. Whether they were depressed or frustrated or frazzled like this young woman was. Words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they can be crafted and they can, they can be things of beauty and they can minister to a, perfect, to a person perfectly. Right? The right words for the right person at the right time. God can use that. God wants to use you. I really believe that God wants to use you to do that. As opposed to the time, you know, where we've, we've all put our foot in our mouth and said the dumbest possible thing we could say in a moment. No, no. God wants to use you. That under the anointing, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you can speak a crafted word into that situation. That word fitly spoken. Amen? Now, that's all great, um, but there are some situations where it's harder to bless people generously. Matthew 5, 43 through 45 says this. Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Here it is, this imitating God thing. Verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So there once again, when we bless those who curse us, we're acting like our Father. We're imitating our Father. You know, one of the hardest things to do 
One of the hardest things to do is to bless people that curse us. One of the hardest things to do is to bless people who are treating us poorly and persecuting us. And you know, many times, you know, this, this, this idea of persecution, we think about missionaries on the mission field who are being persecuted by heathens. Yeah, we know that that all happens, but you know what? You know what? Sometimes persecution comes from inside the church. It does. I relate to this verse very well. This is David speaking in Psalm 55, and he says this. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from him. But it was you, my peer, my guide, my acquaintance. We took pleasant counsel together and walked to the house of God in company. I, I completely identify with this. Um, and I, I have experienced this in my ministry. Of, of being attacked by someone who was my brother and my sister in the Lord. And it was, it was a challenge to, to bless, to, to forgive and to bless was an incredible challenge. And it took me a couple of years to work through it. You know, before I went through what I went through, if I'd have known that you were offended or upset at someone, I just said, I said, well, you know what? Hey, listen, if that, if that person hurt you or offended you, you know, just forgive. Just get over it and just forgive and move on. Well, then I experienced it. And it was, a, it was a process. Forgiveness and blessing that person was a process. You know, I, I, wish, I wish I could guarantee you that you're never, ever going to get hurt by another Christian. But I can't guarantee that. I can't promise you that. And so... Again, oh yeah, yeah, going out, being in the community, blessing people, blessing the grocery clerk, blessing you know, the people I encounter. Yes, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah, well, this is where it gets to be a challenge. And you know what? It's not the easiest way, but it's the best way. It is the best way to live life. This is where we have to follow Jesus' advice and love our neighbors, bless those who curse us, do good to those who hate us, pray for those who spitefully use and persecute us. It is not the easiest thing, but it's the best thing. Amen. So, John 14 talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit He's our counselor, he's our helper, he's our encourager. And I know that as a young Christian, I told you before, I, I really struggled um, with, with a, just a, an issue of profanity and, and cursing. And, and so there was, I was overwhelmed when I first began to learn about some of these things and, and, and what I was dealing with and just kind of the, the patterns in my life that had been established over many years, I was really overwhelmed. And the Holy Spirit wants to help us. And, and so it, it has been a, a process. I don't know that we really draw upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives the way that He wants to help us. So this is my encouragement to you today. Is... If you struggle with your tongue like I did, then enlist the help of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm going to go away and I'm going to send the helper. He's going to be your comforter, your encourager, your helper, your guide. And if this is an issue for you, the Holy Spirit wants to help you. He wants to help you cultivate a harvest of the word of God in your heart. He wants to help you catch those words before they come out. 
He wants to show you the opportunities that you encounter every day to speak creative life into situations. And then everywhere you go, you're able to bless people generously with your words, even the ones that have hurt you. Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? How many of you would be honest and would say, Pastor, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to need all the help I can get. If I'm going to make this change, I need all the help I can get. All right. Thank you, Lord. Father, I lift up your people this morning. I lift up the people of God this morning. And I ask... I thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of every person. Lord, we want to grow more dependent. We want to be more dependent. We don't want to be independent. We want to be God dependent. And we welcome the instruction and the correction and the counsel of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we grow in this. Father, we thank you that you are committed to us. You love us. You will never give up on us. Nothing, no one can ever snatch us out of the palm of your hand, Father. You've begun a work in us. It's a good work. And you will be faithful to complete it. And Father, we thank you that as we make mistakes, and as we fail, and as we blow it, we can get up, we can ask for forgiveness, we can brush ourselves off, we can push the reset button, and we can go on. And we can grow and we can learn, even from our mistakes, even from our failures. You're the God who redeems everything. So Father, I thank you for ministering to God's people today. I thank you that you have met each person right where they are in this journey. And you're showing them the way. You're leading, you're guiding, you're helping, you're encouraging. You are going to show God's people the way. Thank you, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a great day.